and we're delighted to have you here all this afternoon because we're very excited about uh, the kickoff uh, of this launch of the task force's report uh, preview, and it's entitled Permanent Deterrence Enhancements to the U.S. Military Presence in North Central Europe. Let me first give a little bit of context as to how we got to the task force, the establishment of it, why and why we're here today. North Central Europe has truly become one of the key points of confrontation between the West and also Vladimir Putin's revanchist Russia. And it's a confrontation that includes Moscow's continued occupation of illegally, the illegally seized uh, Georgian and Ukrainian territory. We also know there have been military provocations against allied and partner countries, and also a steady buildup of forces, particularly in Russia's western military district and Kaliningrad. Uh, Russia's very determined to disrupt and overturn the order that emerged in the region after the Cold War. This is as we see it. And pulling the United States and NATO allies in the region into a, uh, uh, basically putting, it, uh, putting us at increased risk. So in response, NATO allies have begun to increase their defense budgets and also to develop more effective defense capabilities. And through NATO's enhanced force present, forward presence, four multinational battle groups stand ready in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland as a deterrent force and a symbol of NATO's transatlantic bond and commitment to defend the member states. Now, as we approach NATO's 70th anniversary, uh, we think that there is more that can and should be done to enhance the alliance's deterrence posture in the region. And I would just underscore this is the backdrop to really why we are here today. But let me go on. In April of uh, this year, the government of Poland rolled out, in fact, right here at the Atlantic Council, a proposal to host a permanent U.S. base in the country. And as part of that proposal, Poland offered to invest some $2 billion in necessary infrastructure for a permanent U.S. presence. The proposal was met with, I would categorize it as with great interest in Washington, and indeed Congress had signaled through the National Defense Authorization Act for 2019, as it's known, NDAA, growing bipartisan support for a greater U.S. military presence in Europe, including in Central Europe. And in fact, the NDAA requires the Secretary of Defense to submit a report assessing options for a permanent military presence in Poland. And that report is due in Congress in March of 2019. So we think that this important discussion, which also has implications for NATO and the wider region, certainly could also benefit from really a close, in-depth analysis. And so with that backdrop, let me go on to say the Atlantic Council established the task force on U.S. posture in, in, on US posture in, force posture in Europe, and basically to um, assess the broader political and military implications of an enhanced U.S. posture and presence in North Central Europe. The task force features a bipartisan group of experts, co-chaired by former NATO Deputy Secretary General Ambassador Sandy Vershbau, who you'll be hearing from shortly, and also former SACUR and UCOM uh, Commander General Philip Breedlove. Uh, in addition to myself, uh, the group also includes Project Director Ian Brzezinski. Uh, Ian, are you here? There he is. He's over there. I was going to say, I know he's here today. <laughs> um, Hans Benendijk, who you'll also be hearing from. 
Um, Ambassador Dan Freed, Evelyn Farkas, uh, Bob Newark, who I also know is with us here. Bob, where are you? There you are. Uh, Barry Pavel, uh, who also uh, is here with the group. Uh, Jim Townsend, Damon Wilson, and our rapporteur, Lauren uh, Speranza. Uh, I will keep uh, stopping asking them to wave to you, but a lot of them are here. So why I'm flagging it is because also, hopefully, they will also, too, join in the discussion. And all of them have brought truly a range of expertise to this very crucial discussion. So what's the game plan? The task force will release its full report in early 2019. So please do keep an eye out for that. But with negotiations that are also uh, ensuing between the United States and the Polish government's ongoing. and. Uh, greetings to the Polish ambassador who's here with us uh, today, that we're very delighted that we are able to receive an early preview of the task force's main conclusions today. So what's our game plan? And forgive me, I'm going on a little bit longer because wanted to give you the context, wanted to give you the uh, primary focus, but now let me just say a few words of what you could expect after I sit down and Ambassador Verschgau comes up. First, we're going to be hearing from uh, the task force um, uh, co-chair, Ambassador Verschbau, who will, in fact, outline the key principles and uh, priorities of the task force's report in his keynote remarks. Um, then we're going to have a brief uh, virtual intervention from co-chair General Breedlove, who, as the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and former commander of U.S. Uh, European Command, is a very distinguished uh, voice on these issues. He regrets that he cannot be here, unfortunately, today, but he's going to join us uh, virtually and share his perspectives uh, with a short digital message. Now, following that, we'll hear from Hans Binnendijk, who will go in a bit more deeply with regard to the package and um, uh, um, uh, a description of the recommendations. Following that, we have a stellar panel of experts who have worked and written on these issues, including a fellow task force member, well, Hans Benendijk will come up and be on the, on the panel, Rachel Ilhaus of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Peter Duran of the Center for European Policy Analysis. And we're very delighted to have uh, Julian Barnes of the New York Times, who's going to be moderating. And I'm positive we're going to have a very lively discussion and debating different sides of, uh, of this issue. And we're looking forward to not only hearing from this expert panel, but also for a very active engagement with all of you in the room. We'd like to hear your thoughts and your questions. And let me also just encourage you to also join the conversation on Twitter by following at Atlantic Council and using the hashtag uh, stronger with allies. So now let me introduce formally Ambassador Sandy Virchbaum. It's really a great uh, pleasure to do so. Um, uh, <laughs> and he's going to give his keynote uh, presentation. But let me say just a few words about you. You know, Henry Kissinger used to say when they said, oh, you know, uh, oh, everybody already knows about him. But then when he got up to the platform, he goes, but I would have liked to have heard that introduction about me anyway. So <laughs> don't come up here too fast. Ambassador Verschbau uh, currently serves as a distinguished fellow with the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here at the Atlantic Council, and a position in which we're very lucky to have him because he's really brought a substantial wealth of expertise. I know that many of you in this room know that he previously uh, served from 2012 to 2016 as the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, and then from 2009 to 2012 as Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs in the U.S. Department of Defense. He's also had a very distinguished uh, diplomatic career, including posts as uh, our U.S. Ambassador to NATO, to Russia, and also to the Republic of Korea. So once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and uh, invite Ambassador Verschbau to come up to the podium. And please join me in welcoming him. Thanks very much, Paula. 
and thanks to all of you for coming. It's a pleasure for me to provide today's uh, preview of coming attractions, rated PG-13, uh, namely the conclusions and uh, recommendations of the Atlantic Council Task Force's report on ways to enhance uh, the U.S. force posture in North Central Europe. Uh, the final report will be rated R. <laughs> now, as, as Paula said, our task force was established after the Polish offer in April of $2 billion in support of the establishment of a permanent U.S. base in Poland, one that in its original version could house a full U.S. division. Uh, this offer resonated positively in the Congress, leading to the NDAA tasking of a Pentagon report that Paula mentioned. Uh, friends of Poland uh, knew that this was a reflection of Warsaw's longstanding interest, going back more than a decade over several governments, uh, to have a permanent U.S. presence in Poland. And I remember being lectured many times by Radek Sikorski uh, about uh, why the U.S. should have its troops on today's eastern flank rather than at the old one in Germany. At the same time, uh, the pro Polish proposal reflected the current uh, Polish government's desire to cement an enduring uh, security partnership with the Trump administration while making uh, deterrence against Russian aggression as strong and effective as possible. Now, the ambassador will probably confirm this, that Poles were, uh, across the political spectrum, were thrilled when after they helped convince allies at the 2016 Warsaw Summit uh, of the need for an enhanced forward presence uh, along the eastern flank, uh, that the U.S. then stepped forward uh, to lead the multinational NATO battalion uh, at Orzhizh in Poland, uh, bringing another 550 pairs of American boots on the ground to Poland. But this and other rotational forces were not seen as a sufficiently enduring U.S. commitment, and I think that was part of the motivation for the Polish proposal. Now, as is well known, the, uh, the offer elicited a more mixed response among European allies. Uh, while some conceded that the proposal raised legitimate concerns about the uh, adequacy of the U.S. and NATO force posture, Others questioned whether a large increase in U.S. forces in one eastern flank country uh, would upset the political balance within NATO and even provoke a nasty Russian response. Critics asked whether Poland was starting a kind of zero-sum competition to host U.S. troops in which boots on the ground would go to the highest bidder, which I don't think was the Polish intention, certainly. Some wondered, wondered whether the Polish government government was using the issue to deflect uh, EU pressure on rule of law issues. And I have to say the Fort Trump moniker uh, didn't help all that much. So members of our task force, uh, while aware of the potential for controversy, uh, I think we're much more inclined to see the Polish offer as an opportunity to further strengthen uh, the US and NATO deterrence posture. Uh, the members of our task force agreed that while NATO had done a lot since 2014 with the Readiness Action Plan, the VJTF, the four EFP battle groups, and the new uh, initiatives uh, at the, this year's Brussels Summit to bolster readiness and mobility, uh, even with all of this, there was still uh, some weaknesses and gaps in the NATO posture. And we were especially concerned by the time gap uh, between a possible initial attack and the arrival of reinforcements, especially in short warning and hybrid scenarios. And that this could be the case, this, this vulnerability could still be there even after implementation of the new uh, 430s initiative. So in looking at ways to close the gaps, the task force agreed that it was essential, first of all, to broaden the focus beyond Poland and look at North Central Europe as a region. Uh, it's the part of the eastern flank where we face the greatest vulnerability and the greatest uh, reinforcement challenge, and where NATO itself has taken a holistic uh, regional approach. At the same time, uh, in light of the mixed allied reaction, we agreed it was important as much as possible to work within the agreed NATO framework of deterrence uh, by rapid reinforcement. We didn't think there was any appetite for a paradigm shift moving back towards a, a Cold War-style forward defense strategy. Uh, we also thought that we should try, if possible, to stay within the NATO consensus regarding the scale of any permanent stationing of substantial combat forces that, that would be consistent with allies' commitments under the uh, NATO-Russia Founding Act, which is generally understood to be uh, up to one army brigade per country. Now, let me say that the Founding Act has been violated more ways than I could even count, 
uh, by Russia, not least in its invasion of Ukraine and its conventional military buildup. Yet at the Warsaw and Brussels summits, it was clear that many allies, uh, for many allies, it is still a framework that we hope that Russia, at least someday, will return to. But in practical terms, the task force found that the enhancements we recommended on military grounds could be carried out without precipitating a divisive debate within the alliance over the founding act. Now, we also agreed that while basing issues are formally bilateral matters, uh, the deployments under consideration should nevertheless be the subject of consultations within NATO. Uh, they affect the interests of all the allies, uh, not least those who have skin in the game as the lead nations or participants in the, uh, the EFP battle groups. Now, all of this led us to decide as a first step to agree on a set of uh, nine principles to guide our thinking on possible enhancements uh, to the U.S. force posture in North Central Europe. And these are on page three and four of the report that you've, uh, you've received. In very, in very brief terms, we agreed that the deployments should, you know, first of all, enhance U.S. and NATO deterrent posture for the broader region, not just for the country hosting a particular deployment, that it should reinforce NATO cohesion, promote stability with respect to Russian military deployments, you know, not start an action-reaction cycle. It should include not just additional ground forces, but naval and air deployments, uh, along with uh, essential enablers. It should promote training and operational readiness of U.S. deployed forces and interoperability, both with the host nation forces and other allied forces. It should ensure maximum operational flexibility uh, for the United States to employ its deployed forces uh, in other regions of the alliance and globally. It should expand opportunities for allied burden sharing, uh, including uh, possibly leveraging multinational deployments. This doesn't necessarily have to be a U.S. only affair. Other allies can step up. And it should, of course, ensure adequate host nation support for U.S. deployments. Now, in addition, we agreed that U.S. and NATO decisions should be made in a way that strengthens the foundation of shared values and interests on which uh, the alliance rests. So uh, based on all these principles and keeping in mind the NATO policy framework, uh, we looked at current U.S. deployments in Europe and the considerable uh, capabilities that are already deployed in Poland, which you can see on the map in the, uh, in the report. Uh, and we developed a package of enhancements uh, that you have uh, before you. Taken together, they would, in our view, provide a more effective and a more permanent deterrence posture, uh, while involving a mixture of permanent and rotational capabilities, many of them in Poland, but some of them in, in the Baltic states and the wider region. I'm going to ask Task Force member Hans Binnendijk uh, to sum up the package uh, in detail. But first, uh, let's hear that recorded message from uh, my co-chair, General Phil Breedlove, uh, who unfortunately lives far away from D.C. and couldn't be with us in person today. Sorry I couldn't be there today, but I'm pleased to have this opportunity to preview the conclusions and recommendations of the Force Posture Task Force that I was honored to co-chair with Sandy Birschbaum. Sandy and Hans Benedict will present our detailed recommendations in just a minute. My view is that the situation we face in Europe, given Russia's forced posture and its ongoing aggression against Ukraine and Georgia, requires a serious relook at U.S. and allied forced posture along NATO's northeastern frontier. This is especially the case for North Central Europe, the focus of our task force. This package of recommendations would represent a major boost in U.S. and NATO ability to deter the Russians across NATO's northeastern flank. At the same time, I am confident it is fully consistent with the alliance consensus forged at the last three big NATO summits, Wales, Warsaw, and Brussels. Our assessment is that even with implementation of initiatives like the VJTF, the four multinational enhanced Ford Presence Battalions, and the recent 430s initiative, there is still a risk that NATO reinforcements would not get there in time. That's why we recommended adding to the existing U.S. presence 
while continuing to encourage allies to step up as well. The package builds on the important steps NATO has taken since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014 to bolster the alliance's deterrence posture. It would increase the U.S. presence in Poland, making some current capabilities permanent, including a divisional HQ, the two aviation detachments, and the missile defense base now under construction. It would also add permanent facilities for the current rotating ABCT and soft detachment. The package addresses the entire region holistically, adding a new rotational BCT, home based in Germany, additional soft air and naval capabilities, and lots of enablers to support the rapid mobilization of U.S. forces needed to reinforce rapidly in a crisis. These measures would allow a more persistent U.S. military presence, not only in Poland, but in the Baltic states, and increase the U.S. presence in the Baltic Sea. It presents a means to significantly deepen the U.S.-Polish security relationship and U.S. military ties with the Baltic states. I know that consultations are already underway within the alliance and between the United States and Poland. We hope our recommendations will help in finding a solution that all allies can rally around. Thank you. My job here, I'm Hans Benendijk, my job here is to try to provide a little bit more depth to the specific uh, recommendations that we have made in this report. Uh, before I do that, I would like to make four very brief observations, most of which have already been touched on, but from my perspective, these four observations have tended to frame uh, most of the, these recommendations. And what we're trying to do with the recommendations is to deal with uh, these four sets of issues. The first of these four is that the so-called time distance problem that we have in trying to defend and deter in uh, North uh, Eastern Europe has indeed been addressed by three summits in a row. And uh, progress has been made. Uh, the time gap that uh, uh, is, the, is the issue here uh, has been reduced, uh, but it hasn't been eliminated. And so the first thing we're trying to do is to take some steps to further reduce that gap, which is critical in my perspective to maintain credible deterrence. The second uh, uh, point I'd like to focus on if you have the reports in front of you, take a look at page 7, uh, that there are two appendices in the report which lay out the existing U.S. force structure, first in Poland and then later in the region. And as you look at this, you'll find, as, as we found, that there are at least three problems. Uh, the first is uh, that uh, there really are no U.S. forces, thank you, there really are no U.S. forces uh, in the Baltic states today. We are relying now on some 3,000 plus European forces and three battle groups. We have very little deployed in the Baltic states in, from, in terms of American uh, troops. Uh, secondly, uh, in Poland, um, what we need there is a more continuous and enduring basis to provide greater confidence and continuity. That doesn't mean uh, one large unit there all the time, but it does mean that you, we, they, there has to be confidence that there will always be an American presence there, and I'll detail what that should look like in a minute. Uh, and the, the third problem you'll see if you look at that uh, appendix is that there are no enablers uh, to provide support both for NATO and for U.S. troops. Uh, so these are problems that uh, these recommendations are intended to fix. Um, as Ambassador Verschbau mentioned, um, we believe that uh, maintaining NATO cohesion uh, is critical to this entire effort. That does not mean that we're going to recommend a lowest common denominator. What it does mean is that we need to consult carefully with the allies and listen to them, but we believe these recommendations should be consistent with a broader 
NATO consensus. And then finally, uh, these recommendations need to be consistent with the new U.S. military concept uh, laid out in the uh, most recent uh, defense strategy uh, of dynamic force employment. This is also embedded in the Army strategy. What this means is that uh, forces uh, need to be uh, more agile, more lethal, less operationally predictable, highly ready. They, we're looking at irregular deployments and maximum surge capacity. And we believe that our recommendations are also designed to be consistent with dynamic force employment. So specific recommendations. Uh, these, many of these have been uh, discussed, but let me break them down into five different clusters of recommendations. The first cluster is to upgrade and make permanent several headquarters units and liaison units to provide the continuity uh, that is required for these command elements. Specifically, we're recommending the upgrading of the existing mission command element currently uh, in Poland to make it a permanent Army Division headquarters. Uh, that would provide the capability for the Army to um, operate in time of crisis with all of the forces that it has in Europe, which is about a div division equivalent. Uh, in this second in this cluster, uh, we need uh, to place a headquarters for one Army Combat Aviation Brigade in Poland. Uh, we need to make permanent, uh, as you heard uh, General Brilov say, the two Air Force Aviation Detachments and make them uh, more of a command element. And then finally, and new, uh, we are recommending that a naval detachment also be uh, uh, stationed in Poland to facilitate uh, more U.S. Navy port visits. That's the first cluster. The second cluster is to make rotational units in Poland more continuous and enduring. Uh, think about the notion of continuous rotational presence at permanent installations. Specifically here, we need to, uh, the United States should pledge to maintain uh, U.S. leadership over the NATO battle group currently deployed in Poland. Uh, it needs to maintain one armored brigade combat team in Poland at all times with its units training throughout the region. It needs to maintain one army combat aviation brigade in Poland uh, at all times, again with units training throughout the region. And it should upgrade and make permanent the soft unit that is currently there, headquartered in Poland, and headquarters for that soft capa a larger soft capability. And then while we're uh, uh, making these confirmations, the, uh, we need to reconfirm the permanence of the Aegis Assure deployment. Third cluster, deploy more enablers. This means mid-range air defense, long-range artillery, and MLRS. Uh, more intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, uh, and units like engineers, transport support. Fourth cluster has to do with strengthening other U.S. forces in Europe for training and rapid reinforcement to the northeastern region. Uh, this would essentially make Poland more of a staging area, and we would have forces behind to move more rapidly. First element of this uh, in this cluster is to station one additional U.S. brigade combat team, an armored brigade combat team in Germany. Uh, we had four there uh, 10 years ago in Europe. Uh, we went down to two, then we back up to three. We're recommending going back to four. Um, and this unit, we would envision uh, but perhaps a battalion of this unit forward deployed into Poland and another battalion forward deployed into the Baltic states for training purposes. Uh, there is a new fires brigade that uh, is supposed to deploy to Germany in a few years. We would see elements of that fires brigade forward deployed uh, into Poland and into the Baltic states uh, to support, to do training there and exercises. We recommend home porting of several U.S. Aegis ships in Denmark. Uh, that would uh, allow uh, these Aegis ships to operate in the Baltic Sea uh, and also uh, uh, in to the north. Uh, and with more port visits to Poland and the Baltic states. And then increase the pace of uh, U.S. Air Force exercises in the region. 
The fifth cluster and final cluster of these recommendations has to do uh, with the uh, European uh, uh, Deterrence Initiative, uh, which has very usefully uh, funded prepositioning for one brigade set, runway improvements in Poland, railheads, fuel uh, sites, ammunition storage. We would recommend um, making clear that this is to continue, but we would accelerate it if possible. And then finally, with regard to the Polish contribution uh, of $2 million, uh, $2 billion or more, we, would, we believe this is a good start. We don't think it's enough. Um, and we would recommend that the focus here be on training facilities and headquarters facilities. Training facilities really need to be upgraded to make all of this possible. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's, that's the, uh, those are the details, and uh, I guess we move on to the panel. Yes, I'd like to invite our uh, panelists to come up and join us here. Find your name tags and take a seat. I'm Julian Barnes of the New York Times, uh, and uh, until July, I was uh, based in Brussels for the Wall Street Journal covering NATO and uh, writing all about the NATO buildup uh, and the kinds of issues we're talking today. I want to start with uh, Peter. Um, and Peter, you have uh, been doing your own work uh, with your organization on this very problem. Now, as I read your report, you would have this additional brigade in Poland. Uh, which would uh, perhaps uh, go against the, the language of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Tell me what you think about the Atlantic Council report. Tell me why you think it's better to put this additional rotational presence or this additional presence in Poland rather than Germany. Thanks, Julian. Uh, first off, I really have to commend the Atlantic Council and all the members of the task force for an incredibly substantive and focused analytical effort. Uh, if uh, there is one thing that's needed more than ever right now, it is for analysis, more analysis and less uh, uh, retor trading ret rhetoric on Twitter. And I think the Atlantic Council's effort here by starting with principles and working forward from that point uh, is extremely welcome and needed. And the recommendations are very serious. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, my organization, SEPA, has done a similar uh, effort to look at the analytical picture. And our assessment is this. Uh, the per time for permanent US force posture east of Berlin, uh, well, that's an idea whose time has come. Uh, it is something that not only we can do, but we must do in order to do two things. One, to deter any effort by Russia to test our defenses. And second, to establish what we call ballast in the US Central European relationship. That's missing right now because of the lack of a permanent US force posture east of Berlin. We have that same kind of ballast in our relationship with Turkey. We have that same kind of ballast in our relationship with Germany. It's missing with our relationship with Poland. Uh, and that's creating some costs, negative costs that the United States can and should try and overcome. When I say force posture is an issue of we can and we must, I, I would push back to, uh, on the issue of yes, we can. Because our reading of the uh, NATO-Russia Founding Act is, is tracks exactly with the Atlantic Councils. We can put a permanent brigade east of Berlin and still be within the confines of what we've already agreed to. Russia has already agreed to this. Germany has already agreed to this. So uh, we don't see any status quo impediments to a permanent brigade force posture east of Berlin. I would go one step further my own, in my own assessment and say the conditions of 1997 are long gone and unlikely to return in our lifetimes. And unless and until we come to terms with that hard fact, we are going to do ourselves a disservice and we're going to endanger the safety and security of Europe. So maybe one point to, to look at when we assess these recommendations, many of which I would fully endorse. Uh, one point to, to hang our hat on is what can Poland do? 
We've heard a lot so far about what, uh, what Poland's put on the table, one to two billion dollars, <coughs> perhaps maybe more. I think the Pentagon has a high price tag for toilet paper, plungers, toilet seats, <laughs> things like that. I'm sure we can find ways to economize, but set that aside. What can Poland do to help? Well, right now we got a problem. And that is that our forces aren't necessarily able to exercise uh, as realistically as possible as they can in Germany due to restrictions on account of red tape. We can cut that red tape. We can find ways in which the United States Army and Polish forces can exercise in live joint fires uh, activities uh, in the same way that they can in Germany. The US Army has to maintain a high level of readiness if it is going to have a permanent brigade east of Berlin. That's essential. And right now, we're not yet there. This is a solvable problem. And that's, I think, my final message here. Whenever we look at the impediments to U permanent US force posture east of Berlin, I look at these impediments, and every single one of them is a solvable problem. And it falls now to the Atlantic Council, to SIPA, and other friends of freedom in Europe to solve those problems. Like I said, yes, we can, and yes, we must. I think the imperative is that we must move our forces east of Berlin permanently. Rachel, I want you to react to the uh, Atlantic Council uh, report, what you like about it, uh, what, what raises a, f a flag with you, and also your assessment of how the Pentagon is going to look at this. How are they looking at the problem? What are they likely to do in the months to come? So thank you very much. Um, I just want to echo, echo what Peter said. This is a very welcome effort. Uh, U.S. and NATO are always refining their planning and their deterrence model based on the changing security environment. And this is very helpful to policymakers as they try to respond to the national defense uh, agreement by March and make some decisions and get back to our Polish counterparts. Um, one issue where I, I might take a little bit um, a different tack than Peter did was the, the idea that we don't have ballast. Uh, in our relationship with Poland. We have more than 4,000 forces uh, in Poland right now. Those are U.S. forces, not to mention allied forces. Poland's an important partner. It's our anchor of U.S. presence in Northern Europe. Uh, but we need to think theater-wide. And you asked how the Pentagon's going to approach this. So they're going to think theater-wide in Yukon, and they're going to think globally. The eastern flank is 1,800 kilometers long. And I think we need to be thinking about um, if we put you know, the, the amount of, of things, you know, that the report is recommending up in uh, the northeast corner of Europe, how that affects our presence in the Black Sea. So I think we need to be thinking about that entire border. What enhances deterrence and increases overall security in Europe? So that would be my first reaction. Uh, my second reaction is, again, uh, to agree with Peter. I think you, you did a wonderful job in outlining the principles. Um, I was pleased to say, see that you want to maintain the framework of deterrence by rapid reinforcement and make enhancements, because I do think US and NATO have made some good progress since 2014, and refining rather than replacing those elements that have put in place is, is the way to go. I just wanted to, to remind folks that at the July summit, uh, we created a, a helpful framework, uh, I think, uh, for allies to understand uh, where, where we need to, what more we need to do in the future to reinforce this deterrence model. Uh, the United States spoke about command structure adaptation. So command and control and making sure all these headquarters elements and pieces fit together. Readiness and reinforcement, the 430s, which Hans was very involved in. Military mobility, so the ability to get things across the Atlantic and move them around Europe as well. And then finally, and the one we probably made the least progress on is speed of crisis decision making. And I saw the report. Uh, you didn't outline it, but towards the end, it had some very good recommendations about uh, transfer of authority of U.S. forces to SACUR and giving him some crisis decision-making leeway as well, which, which I very much appreciated. But as we think through the, the value of these, I just keep those big four in mind because those are the enhancements to the existing model that I think we should be looking at. Um, what enables the forces that are are already on the ground to be more lethal? What enables those forces to talk to one another? What enables those small headquarters elements to uh, accept more throughput uh, and reinforce one another? Uh, and so to that end, the, I'll, um, I'll not go into the specific proposals now, although I'm happy to do that as we go on, but I will highlight four principles that I think would probably be uh, most important in the U.S. government calculations. So a lot has been said about the importance of NATO unity. Uh, I agree with that, but I turn it on its head. 
it's really not about the NATO Russia Founding Act and how NATO perceives this. I mean, you know, as as I think you said, Ambassador Vershbal, that's been violated in in you know ten ten or more different ways. <coughs> what re the reason that NATO unity matters is the perception of the allies. If there are allies that are uncomfortable with the nature of the presence, either because of the signal that it sends to Russia, or because it's too much in one place and it and it leaves them uncovered, uh, I think we need to think about what allies think because we're all in this together. And the best deterrent is alliance unity. The second, uh, which Hans alluded to, was dynamic force employment. Now, while I liked a lot of the recommendations, and I think some of them do provide that strategic predictability and operational unpredictability that is behind dynamic force employment, I think there are others that don't necessarily do that and may jeopardize it. And I'm happy, happy to go into that. Um, and those who aren't familiar with di dynamic force employment, the idea is basically, you know, I think Secretary Mattis said it best when he said, we don't telegraph our punches. So we want uh, to let people know that we're going to do something and we're going to act, but you can never be exactly sure how. Uh, this was just exemplified by the carrier strike group that joined Trident Juncture 18. That took the Russians a bit by surprise. Um, everyone thought it was going to the Med, and then suddenly it, you know, turned a little bit north and a little bit east. <laughs> so um, I think that's that's the kind of metric that we have to put put on on these recommendations as well. Third, and another one <coughs> where I would say some of the recommendations don't quite meet the bar that I would say the Pentagon has for operational flexibility. Um, the U.S. is a global power; it requires global power our projection and the ability to use the forces and capabilities anywhere. So when we think about the presence of the 173rd in Italy, of course they have a primary NATO role, but they're also supporting the Middle East and North Africa missions as well. I would want that fidelity from our, our Polish and Baltic partners that those forces would truly be global availability. And that brings me to my fourth consideration, which is readiness. Would they be able to retain the readiness for global missions? Does Poland and, and others in the region have the world-class training facilities that we have in Germany to retain the readiness when they're deployed and doing these constant rotations? Because the one thing we know about the strategic environment is that it's unpredictable. So you have to be ready for all of these eventualities. Um, with that, I think I'll stop. I mean, I liked a lot of the recommendations, in particular, uh, the idea of transitioning the division headquarters, the, the mission command element to a division headquarters because of the throughput it brings. I'm not convinced it needs to be permanent. I think that's probably a question that will come out. Um, and I'd also warn against the proliferation of headquarters. I think mm. in the command structure adaptation, we did see a lot of people coming forward you know, with, with good intentions, but, but it's better to increase the number of combat ready units than the number of headquarters. Julian, can I just do a quick jump in because I want to echo a point that was just made okay. here. It is essential that when we talk about uh, alliance cohesion, uh, three words become the defining words of, of how we frame this conversation with our allies. Engage, engage, engage. Half of the problem we have right now within the alliance is that there is no shared threat assessment about Russia. The way in which some countries on the east view the Russian threat is wildly different than how that threat is viewed in Berlin or Lisbon for that matter. Uh, the United States can and probably should do a lot more to engage, 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 specifically Germany, on its assessment of why we view the threat differently, what we're doing about it, how we're going about it. Uh, these kinds of conversations are absolutely necessary in order to ensure that critical alliance cohesion that got mentioned. The other point though on US global force posture is critical because the elephant in the room in this discussion about permanent force presence is not Russia, it's China. Right now, if you look at the US national security strategy, we are coming to terms in a very realistic way with what long-term great power competition with China is gonna look like. That long-term com competition is gonna drain massive amounts of resources, manpower, and policymaker attention away from Europe. The United States must fix European defense in order to be capable of pursuing long-term strategic competition with China. If we fail to do so, we're going to send a terrible message to the Russians. It's going to say, the candy store is open and unguarded. Worse, we're going to communicate that to the Chinese that we're spread too thin and we can't keep our global commitments. This is where we ha I would reiterate, though, we need to establish the same kind of permanent ballast in our relationship uh, with Poland in much the same way that we have that permanent ballast through our force posture in places like Germany, uh, Belgium, and Turkey. Okay, uh, Sandy and Hans, I want you both to react to what they both just said, what Rachel's uh, uh, talk about operational flexibility. How do, 
how do you think this, your way of looking at this, preserves uh, operational flexibility? Clearly, you were thinking about that when you you mm. did this, and also address her point of is this too much for the Northeast? Uh, Vladimir Putin is making trouble in Ukraine right now. Uh, there's a constant trouble in Georgia. Are we putting too many eggs in one part of Europe? So react to her points, react to that. Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, I uh, appreciate the, the comments, and, uh, I, and Rachel's particularly well informed as to how this might be uh, re received, having only recently departed the Pentagon. Uh, but I think you know, we, uh, see this issue of operational flexibility partly as a political one. It needs, there needs to be an understanding with, uh, with the, the host nations, and Poland in particular, that forces assigned to Poland are not restricted for use in the defense of Poland or, or the wider region, that they are truly available globally. And then there's the issue of readiness. I mean, we, we, uh, we do recommend that one of the ways that Poland could spend its $2 billion or maybe even more money is to bring its training facilities up to the same kind of high standard that we uh, can rely upon, Peter made this point as well, in, uh, in Germany, uh, so that uh, if they have to go either to another part of Europe or, uh, or somewhere uh, out of area, uh, they are at that high level of readiness that we would, uh, we would insist upon. Uh, as far as uh, t you know, too much in the north, uh, I think what we are suggesting is not a dramatic e expansion. I mean, the additional BCT would add some real uh, uh, additional numbers. But we think that the, the North Central European f challenge is the greatest. It's, it's different. I mean, there may be a case for uh, more troops uh, rotating into southeastern Europe, Romania and Bulgaria, particularly as the Russians are uh, building up their forces and uh, behaving in an even more provocative way. Uh, but the, you know, the scenarios of a kind of out of the blue land grab or a hybrid scenario, destabilization, subversion, uh, are most immediate in the Baltic states. And having the capacity to reinforce really quickly uh, with the enablers in place, with uh, uh, air, air uh, to back up the ground forces, uh, all this is essential if we're going to close this gap in, uh, in, in time required to ensure that the reinforcements are there before the, these valiant multinational battalions aren't uh, uh, overrun. Uh, so, I mean, these, these are political judgments, but we think that there is room for uh, expansion in, uh, in North Central Europe. Hans, I want you to, to weigh in on uh, what Peter and Rachel have said, but I also want you to talk about uh, what your plan does for a U.S. presence in the Baltic states as well, because uh, when Atlantic Resolve began, we had a company in each of them. Now that we have the enhanced forward presence, we often have United States troops rotating in, but it's not constant. And that has been a sticking point for the Baltics. Will this plan only answer the Polish concerns, or do you, does your plan also answer the Baltic uh, countries' worries? Yeah, I, I hope it does uh, uh, address their immediate concerns. We would do that. We talk about the need for enablers added throughout the region. I've had the chance. Uh, to visit uh, the NATO battle groups. Uh, Sandy and I went together to Latvia. I've been to Lithuania. I've talked to the commander of the Estonian uh, uh, NATO battle group. And uh, they have a pretty clear idea of what they need to be able to sustain a fight. And it has to do with air defense. It has to do with uh, 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 a, a constant supply of ammunition, ammunition storage. Uh, it has to do with uh, uh, long-range artillery, MLRS, some command and control, better rules of engagement. So there's a list of things that I think are quite consistent uh, with our recommendations. Um, while much of the focus of this report was on the Polish contribution, we did see that in the context of a broader regional uh, problem. Now. Uh, with regard, let me maybe just make one comment about each, about uh, your four uh, points, Rachel. Uh, the first on NATO unity. Uh, I think there, will, there, there may be some, uh, we're going to have to convince some allies that a package like this uh, is consistent with current NATO strategy and uh, does not violate uh, the NATO-Russia Founding Act. 
Uh, I think we're all in agreement that that act has been violated, but we also don't want to do things that break NATO cohesion at a time. NATO is as fragile as I've seen it in 40 years working on NATO. Uh, and we don't want to do anything else to further fracture it. But I think we can make the case that this is a brigade reinforced and it is not there deployed on a permanent basis. It may be continuous, it may be enduring, um, but it is still a rotational brigade. So I think we can make the case to our allies Think you're right. that this is not inconsistent with the NATO-Russia Founding Act. We don't need to jettison that right now uh, because I, th I think we have, there's another way to do this. The second point I would make uh, is with regard to dynamic force employment. If you look at the way that uh, the current armored brigade is deployed in Poland now, it's not in one place. Uh, it, it has a headquarters, but it, it, it trains in about five or six different areas all along the Polish-German border. So already inherent in the way it's deployed is some of this notion of uh, dynamic force employment. They're dispersed. Yes. Uh, so there are el already elements in that. We would continue that. Uh, with regard to operational flexibility, <coughs> I'd make two points. One, within the region, we would recommend a great deal of operational flexibility. In fact, stretch it, use it throughout the region. But even if we're talking about out of the region, one of the principles, the nine principles that Sandy went through, has to do with maintaining this kind of flexibility. So we did think about that and took it into account. And then finally, on readiness, uh, when you talk to our uh, military, especially the Army, uh, we have some fantastic training facilities in Germany. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that there is some reluctance within the army to, uh, to go uh, full bore in, into Poland is that they want better training facilities. And that's why we recommended that uh, this, is, this ought to be the first priority for the $2 billion that uh, is being discussed. If you can enhance those training facilities, you're going to have to find the army more interested uh, in operating out of there, uh, in training there, and it's going to make the whole thing a lot easier. Peter, one thing that your report touched upon that the Atlantic report also, Atlantic Council report also touched on, is that two billion dollars is probably not enough. Um, that it is a beginning, but that this building up training facilities, bringing up permanent basing is going to be more expensive than that. Is there a way to get other allies to contribute to this? Is there a way to get Germany to help pay for this? Or is this viewed in Europe as simply a Polish request, and so it's for the Poles and the United States to pay for? Well, if we come to this discussion with the understanding that this is an idea whose time has come, and we can and we must, and the answer is absolutely there is a way. Uh, I certainly think that this has been a bilateral discussion between the United States and Poland, and obviously NATO doesn't get a veto over what the United States and Poland can agree to. That too is in the NATO-Russia Founding Act. But understanding that we need to have a conversation within the alliance and that we need to engage, engage, engage people and countries that have concerns, legitimate concerns about what this means, then there's a lot of new opportunities, uh, opportunities that open up. Just look at Trondheim, Norway. Right now, U.S. Marines are living and working and firing their weapons alongside and training facilities alongside their Norwegian counterparts. We have U.S. forces positioned in and on the permanent military facilities of our NATO allied countries. Norway is a great example. Uh, South Korea has another example. So what uh, we think that is one way to explore this is to look at existing and highly successful templates the Pentagon is already using to deploy American forces into Europe and elsewhere overseas and to apply those to Poland. Once you do that, you actually find that it's a lot easier than we might assume. Right now, the, we have a U.S. combat aviation uh, detachment that is uh, basically on a, rota a permanently rotating uh, stationed uh, deployment in Poland. Their orders uh, are, are such that they're, they're there for the long haul. That's the problem we have to assess underneath all of these practical policy level uh, questions. Right now, 
when we ha talk about heel to toe or rotational force posture east of Berlin, there's a problem because our allies look at that, the rotational uh, force posture and they see temporary. Our allies can misinterpret this to mean easy come, easy go. The Americans are here today, but maybe with this competition with China, they might be gone tomorrow. It is imperative for the United States to communicate the permanence and staying power of our Article 5 commitments by making our force posture east of Berlin permanent. This is why I would underscore finding existing templates and models to make that happen. Rachel, can you react to that? Yes. So first of all, I, I fundamentally disagree that, you know, the permanence is the only thing that shows our commitment to the allies. If anything, you know, if we if 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 the security situation would change and we had to respond to a China or North Korea scenario, I hope our allies would be with us and they'd understand the need for that operational flexibility. So if anything, I think permanence ties us down in a way that is unhelpful given the unpredictability of today's security environment. Again, going back to dynamic force employment, we want to have that element of um, you know, flexibility and surprise, and we want to be able to adjust. Uh, rotational versus permanent, another point is rotational is actually proven to be surprisingly a better option than we had thought in the past. Uh, I think initially it was out of necessity as we were trying to do the rebalance to Asia and we were trying to reconcile a lot of our forces in Europe and consolidate our bases. We moved to a rotational model for Europe. Now we're slowly moving back towards permanence, but we've seen more units and more soldiers rotating through Europe early in, earlier in their career and getting exposure to our allies. So while there may be some downsides, there are also some upsides to rotational. You know, you've got units from Texas and Kansas who've all deployed to Poland in addition to Afghanistan and Iraq and that sort of exposure to me builds the cohesiveness of the alliance. Uh, one more point to your earlier question about whether we should be asking Germany and other allies to pay for the infrastructure in Poland. I think that is you know not really the way things work. I mean there <laughs> is an article in the NATO treaty called Article 3 that speaks to resilience and self-help. So just as the Baltic states have done uh, over and again, they're a wonderful model of this, and, and Poland as well is, it's your responsibility as a host nation to build it and reinforce it so allies can come. And that's what Trident Juncture ex exercised. That's what Aurora exercised in Sweden. It is the re responsibility of the nation may be offset by NATO uh, and, and NATO security investment funds, um, but that is an Article Three responsibility of the host nation. Yeah. I, would, I would agree with that. Uh, first of all, I think we, we were guided by the assumption that there is a strong uh, preference for rotational forces Good. because of the benefits for readiness. Uh, we tried to kind of square the circle by sort of putting permanent facilities, you know, giving us a sense that this is not here today, gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the burden sharing aspects of this, uh, Rachel's right, uh, the host nation is expected to, 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 to bear this responsibility. But we do stress, we didn't bring this out in our opening uh, briefings, that we would like to use this as uh, a means to leverage other contributions by other allies to get the Germans perhaps to put uh, some personnel e either in the headquarters or maybe even uh, some troops to, to deployed in Poland to, mm -hmm. to, to operate and train with uh, either the existing BCT or the, or the new one that we would send in. Uh, and in that case, then there might be a basis for, uh, for, for allies to share some of the financial burdens. But the NATO Security Investment Program may be one multi, it's not a huge pot of money, but that could finance some of the uh, uh, installations if they have a NATO uh, flag on them. Hans, is there a way, I want you to react, but I also want you to say, is there a way that you see some of the kinds of needs you've uh, identified, whether they're air, naval, air defense, being met by an ally, not necessarily the United States, but also react to the conversation so far? Yeah. Uh, first, let me just say a word about permanent. Uh, sometimes it's good to get a thesaurus out. <laughs> uh, the word permanent um, has a problem because it's the word that is used in the NATO Russia Founding Act. Uh, and so, it, in a sense, it's limited. Uh, it is better to talk about enduring, continuous, uh, words like that. The, the effect is the same. But secondly, <coughs> if when you use the word permanent, you, you conjure up the notion of a big base with a lot of housing facilities, and a lot of dependents, and PXs. Uh, 
that's not a fighting capability. It's, you know, it's, maybe it's deterrence because American civilians' independence are in the way, but we just saw in South Korea that that could be really limiting. We are much better off having units deployed that are ready to fight, that have the attributes that this notion of dynamic force employment attributes. That is a much better deterrent force than a base with PXs. This ought to look like a forward operating base in Iraq more than it looks like Ramstein Air Force Base. Uh, I would, I wouldn't. <laughs> Maybe that way, but that it, that's a different kind of mission again. Yeah. But yes, you need you need a fighting capability, not a lot of dependence in the way. Okay, we want to open this up to audience questions here, uh, sir. Uh, there should be a microphone coming, and here, oh uh, yes, right in the front here. Two more seconds, and the gentleman will have the microphone for you. Uh, I'm Bob Bradkey, former State Department official, and now at the McCain Institute. I wonder whether the task force has looked at the impact of the U.S. decision to withdraw from the INF Treaty on the recommendations that you're making and on our force posture in that part of Europe. Um, Ambassador Burstow. <laughs> Uh, the short answer is, is no. Uh, we were focusing on conventional forces and, uh, and fr frankly, given the delicacy of the uh, intra-alliance uh, debate, inter-alliance politics on nuclear issues, we didn't think that uh, any of the recommendations should address changes to NATO's uh, nuclear footprint or nuclear strategy in Europe. Now, there may be, over time, once the uh, alliance begins to look at options for uh, answering the additional military threat fa that we face because of the Russia's, Russian deployment of this uh, illegal system. There may be uh, a case for deployments of some systems in, in Northeastern Europe, or, uh, but, uh, but we saw that as sort of a premature to, uh, to factor into our analysis. I, would, I agree with that. The one minor thing that uh, we did uh, say in the report is that it's now important to uh, to pledge uh, for that the uh, Aegis Ashore deployment will continue and that it will be permanent. And that is related in, in this sense that one of the Russian charges uh, against the United States with regard to the INF debate is that these deployments are somehow illegal. It's a fallacious argument, but I think it's worth just reinforcing the commitment to deploy. Uh, a question in the second row here. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. Thanks. Uh, an observation and then a couple of very short questions. Uh, I think you need to look really carefully on this assumption of rapid reinforcement because I believe it's a huge vulnerability uh, when you take a look at the lift and capacity and there are ways to cut this off without firing a shot which the Pentagon is, is studying and also the whole issue of logistics in Europe to make stuff move forward is really a bad, really a, a big issue. Uh, my first question is, what about Russian reaction and response? It seems to me that Putin has ways of trumping, if I may use that phrase, uh, in many, many ways. Uh, for example, supposing he made a further land grab in Ukraine. So what do you think the Russian response is? Second, have you really looked closely at cost, because I would argue the U.S. military does not have the force structure to do what you want. It's overstretched, and I think what you're saying, you talk about two destroyers to, the de to Denmark, hence that's not going to happen. Uh, so have you taken a look at the stress and strain in terms of cost and whether we can do it? And finally, it seems to me one of the biggest weekends we have in terms of Atlantic cohesion, I call the 3M problem, May, Merkel, and Macron and Putin is going to exploit that. So what do we do to deal uh, with the political issues here through using for a military force in a political sense, but also uh, with active measures? Because it seems to me our greatest vulnerability is not to the Russians moving west in a military sense, but active measures. And how did you think about incorporating that into your uh, recommendations? Hans, I want you to tackle that first. And then Rachel, I want you to react a little bit to the political dynamic that was in that question. Well, I, first, Harlan, I agree with you on the uh, rapid reinforcement problem. Uh, it's there. That was really the focus of sort of three different summits, and the four times thirty uh, initiative uh, was designed to 
come to terms with that. It's going to take a while to get to get that done. So yeah, and then even even if you have the ready forces, you need to be able to move them forward. You need a decision making process. As we just heard, that's still a, a weakness. Uh, with regard to the Russian reaction, you know, it they they sh by rights they should not respond to this. But well, if there are, there are all sorts of options. Well, I think what the concern is that they will move uh, into Belarus with some forces. Well, they're already there. Well, I mean, I think the new. Yeah. Well, they're th that may already be there. But uh, I, I guess the the concern that I've heard the most is the is Belarus. Uh, but uh, you know, we need to do what we think we need to do to provide adequate deterrence without. And I don't think this force structure change that we're recommending is any way, in any way aggressive or in any way threatens Russia. They may see it differently, and even if they don't, they may react anyway, just as the opportunity presents itself. On your, on your home porting point, uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, it may well be that home porting is cheaper uh, than uh, moving forces, uh, naval forces. I mean, you're the former naval person, but uh, we, we, we now have, you know, we have four Aegis ships in Rota. Uh, we have nothing in the north, and the need in the north is now greater than in the south. i just leave it at that. Rachel. Uh, so I think it was beyond the scope of the report. You focused on conventional, but, but to your first question, I do think that, you know, the national defense strategy talks about expanding the competitive space. So not just looking at conventional, but looking at gray zone tactics, electronic warfare, hybrid cyber. So I think personally the more likely scenario is something that's more you know under the threshold so we talk about posture here but to get at you know the Russian reaction we have to have a lot of different things in our toolkit um, I like your 3M moniker for May Miracle Macron I think from a US perspective there's a couple things we can do um, the first is if and when the UK ever gets out of you know the brexit roundabout um, we should encourage a strong UK EU defense partnership it's in the UK's interest, it's in our interest, and it's in the EU's interest. The UK has the majority of the forces and the capabilities, and EU defense will be nothing without UK involvement. Um, equally, we need to continue to find ways to work uh, usefully uh, between NATO and the EU and to make sure that the EU defense efforts do, in fact, reinforce NATO um, and the European pillar of NATO. Uh, we also, and we often do, utilize what's called the Quad. So it's the U.S. plus, you know, U.K., France, and Germany to build consensus and positions before we take them into the alliance at 29 or into other multilateral institutions. It's hard, but uh, you know, I think we can we can work on an interest-based uh, approach to, to to you know, as the as the hashtag says, stronger with allies. Can I field that security spiral issue, which was implied and actually straightforward in, in the way you, you framed it? The one thing to remember here is that, because this comes up, if we do X, Putin will do Y. If we do X plus one, Putin, Putin will do Y plus two. I would argue this. Right now, the security spiral is already happening. Uh, Vladimir Putin is not deterred by the elements we've, all, we've currently put in place. There already is a Fort Putin in Georgia, in Crimea, the Donbas, Syria, and Kaliningrad. Putin has made five major moves on the geopolitical board without a permanent response by us. That's, that's a dynamic that must change, and that's why I am uh, you know, encouraged by the discussion that is leading us to find permanent responses to Putin's existing provocations against us. We have a question in the fourth row, the gentleman with the blue tie. Thank you, Mikos Lazar Sipa. Um, I'd like to go back to the question of permanence, actually. Um, Germany has, uh, sorry, Germany has uh, been very central uh, for NATO in that respect. And I was wondering whether it is time to look at it from a messaging uh, perspective, a signaling sort of perspective, and, and um, consider what sort of uh, message it would send to have something permanent in Poland uh, to the new region, which, which joined, of course, in 2004, I mean, when it comes to the EU, and whether it would show a sense of emancipation for that region. So whether we could 
look at this not only in terms of defense, and of course these are very important questions and they are much more technical, but um, we are not quite sure whether, you know, um, um, Germany uh, and and Poland should not be more equal in that respect. Do you think there is there is anything around, uh, in in this topic, or or do you think this is con con completely arbitrary? Um, because I, I do think that many East Europeans and East Central Europeans would find it important. Sandy, I want you to uh, tackle that. No one knows the founding act and <laughs> better than you do, and the word uh, the difficulties over the, over the word permanence. Well, that's one aspect of the question. I think it was a more philosophical question about uh, you know, where is the center of gravity of the alliance. But uh, I think on the issue of permanent, I would disagree with Peter that you know, we, don't, we fail to counter the Russian threat. I mean, I think it, it is the fact that even though the battalions that we put into the Baltic states and Poland, they're small, but you know, they're permanent in the sense that they're not going to be withdrawn. I mean, they, they, the forces themselves change from uh, every six months or every nine months. Uh, but it is a permanent commitment by the alliance, and I think we're, you know, it needs further reinforcement in terms of uh, the, the 430s initiative, ensuring that we have the ability to back these troops up. But I don't think uh, we're doing as badly as, as you, you suggested. It's a different story in terms of non-NATO members who are facing this, the threat, you know, even, even, even as we speak, in terms of the Russian buildup. Uh, in the Azov Sea and in the, in the Black Sea and the potential uh, first for new mischief uh, during our, to, to disrupt our holidays uh, in the next few weeks. But this issue of, uh, you know, should uh, Poland become a, be put on equal footing with Germany in terms of the sort of the alliance strategy? I mean, I think in some, some ways the East has become the, the focal point of everything that we're doing. I mean, th this is where the greatest vulnerability is. And, You've seen, uh, you know, NATO reorient itself to to you know relearn and rebuild deterrence from the ground up uh, over the last four and a half years, uh, and so uh, the strategy is centered on the east. But Germany plays a pivotal role, you know, as the uh, key place from which the you know, reinforcements either emanate or flow through. Uh, and uh, Germany itself has taken on huge responsibilities with this new command under the NATO command structure. Uh, so it, it shouldn't be seen as some kind of zero-sum game here. Uh, I think we're trying to suggest ways where we can show the increasing importance of Poland uh, by you know, building on the already significant capabilities that are there, making clear that Poland is not just a frontline state, but it's also an important linchpin in the defense strategy. Poland is key to reinforcing the Baltic states in the, in the same way that Germany is key to reinforcing the, you know, the wider eastern flank. So uh, I, I think this, this will evolve over time and we'll see as, as we improve and fill in the gaps in, in the strategy that there will be an you know, increasing place for Poland. It shouldn't be measured by whether you have a, a giant base or not. It should be in terms of the, the, the role you play and the, and the key role that Poland does play as an, as an ally of punches above its weight, is going to go not just to 2%, but to 2.5% of GDP over the coming years, setting a good example in that regard. Uh, so, um, but let's not diminish you know, Germany with its huge military capability and the, and the key new responsibilities it's taking on in the current security environment. Hans, we've talked uh, at times here, or we've mentioned at times the 430s initiative. This is the idea of getting uh, allies to have ready forces uh, able to reinforce. How do you ensure that if a version of the plan that you've laid out is put into effect, that that does not take pressure off other allies from creating more ready forces, which has been identified as, as a critical problem here? Yeah. Um, well, they have, a, they have agreed to do it. They have agreed to a time frame. Uh, there are plans within the military structure now as to how you proceed to achieve those goals. They are attainable goals. Um, I think more needs to be done on the implementation front. We have to figure out where those forces, the ready forces come from. They have to be designated. They have to be certified. And we need an organizational structure to deal with those forces. I mean, they're just ready forces now, but how do they plug into the NATO command structure for various missions? So much more needs to be done, but I don't see uh, the kind of a proposal that we put forward as leading to the conclusion on the part of the allies that, you know, the United States is 
doing more so we can stand easy. In fact, the reverse will be true. I think the pressure now on the Allies for greater burden sharing is going to drive a lot, mm -hmm. uh, including the four times 30. Rachel, Peter had said, um, raised worries about whether Russia is uh, deterred enough uh, from Poland and the Baltics. Uh, what is your view of the current situation? If nothing more is done, if there is no Fort Trump, if we just stick with the uh, rotational brigade we have and the NATO EFPs, um, is that unacceptable risk in your mind for Europe? I don't think so. I mean, I think there are, there are refinements that need to be made to the existing model, and a lot of the recommendations in the report get at that. So it's beefing up the infrastructure, in particular the headquarters elements at the division level, because they allow for that throughput of the follow-on forces. They allow the different elements to talk to one another. The report also nods to a lot of the enablers, like ISR engineers, um, things that are really going to help those EFP units uh, walk talk together. So there's always going to be an element of risk and unpredictability, but I think we've got a pretty strong model. I also really like the idea that we have not just U.S. forces, um, we also have NATO forces. So one of the strongest things about EFP is that you do have Germans on the ground, and that means there's German skin in the game. Not to pick on Germany, but you know, it, it, it does mean something that it's an alliance presence, and um, I, I think the multinationality ha has its strengths and actually reduces the risk. Hans, when you want Aegeus uh, destroyers in Denmark, would you take them from Spain or would you like them <laughs> to come from the continental United States? I think they would have to come from elsewhere because the four that are currently in, uh, in Rota uh, have a uh, missile defense mission. So you would probably have to find a couple elsewhere. Uh, and um, you, know, you have to do the studies, but I, Get those I'm not convinced building. that it wouldn't be cost effective uh, to put them there. It's certainly from a military point of view, it is cost effective because they can swing both ways. But let me just say uh, just a, another word about uh, deterrence, because that's what we're all about here. No one wants to fight a war in Europe. It's about enhancing deterrence. And the risk here, as I see it, is that you do have this time gap uh, between how long frontline forces can hold out and the time it takes to reinforce. And that time gap would be used by Moscow uh, to try to divide the alliance. So the whole way to enhance deterrence is to be able to fight through that, to not have a gap. So that means you, you have to beef up frontline forces so that they can fight longer, and that's what we're doing. That's what the battle groups are about. That's what our recommendation about future enhancements is about. And you have to, you have to reduce the amount of time it will take to get forces forward. That's what the four times 30 uh, initiative is about. That's what the VJTF is about. The, third element I would add here is the importance of air power, because air power has the capability to fill that gap so that you don't have a gap. And that's why the, uh, another reason why we have recommended uh, a uh, greater activity on the part of the U.S. Air Force here. Peter, what do, you, what do you think about the ability to get to the crisis place fast enough? Um, will the Atlantic Council's plan here with a rotation, additional rotational unit in Germany be able to solve that problem of reinforcing before Vladimir Putin changes the facts on the ground? The organizing problem for the alliance right now is that we have to be able to move at the speed of relevance. Uh, if there was a test of our resolve as an alliance in the Baltic states, for example, uh, we have to move very quickly, deploy over long distances, cross border checkpoints, and, cut a, uh, and deal with a lot of red tape. All of these things will occur under peacetime conditions. Uh, I think having, uh, I would echo what Hans has said, having our forces closer 
to where a potential crisis point <coughs> could erupt, not farther away, and then training on cross-border mobility, training on how we can swiftly roll out of the motor pool and deploy to where U.S. Uh, troops and NATO troops would be needed, that's key. We have to be able to move at the speed of relevance. That's where the enablers come in. I would wholeheartedly underscore the absolute importance of having more enablers, not just in Poland, but throughout the, uh, the Baltic states. Right now, if a truck breaks down in Estonia under Operation Atlantic Resolve Northeast, the good American soldiers based out of Mariupol, Lithu Mariupol, Lithuania, have to travel all the way up to Estonia to recover, say, a US truck, and take it all the way back to Mariupol. Along the way, there's nowhere to stop for fuel, for food, or to rest up. This is what happens when you don't have a large enough enabler footprint and network spread throughout the Baltic states. I can envision taking the uh, ideas put forward by uh, the task force uh, and building them up. Let's have a permanent enabler network of U.S. flags with U.S. officers uh, positioned in all three Baltic states that stretches back through Poland and back to into Germany. This is how we're going to show Russia, and more importantly, Russian war planners, that whatever they're thinking of, whatever low-scale hybrid uh, probe they might try, the alliance will be able to move fast, cross great distances, and be more relevant than their plan. That's how you create deterrence in the mind of an opponent. Rachel, how big a problem is it for the Pentagon today being able to uh, have the flexibility to put use your forces globally, but also react quickly in a trouble spot where somebody is trying to use their geographic uh, advantage. Um, yeah, I think things are, are getting better. I think of the example of naval forces where there was a period of reset and now the Navy's probably at a point where they can start to think about, about you know, deploying more globally. I think it's probably different for, for every force. Um, I've also, you know, I'm, I'm once removed from it now, but I believe a lot of the combatant commands are getting more of the baseline forces that they've requested. But I think part of the Pentagon strategy is to make sure that you plan for that element of surprise and that you leave yourself that headroom so you don't dole out all the forces to the combatant and functional commands. Initially, you have some in reserve, so to say, so that you can respond in that more flexible way. We're about out of time. I want to give uh, Sandy, you the last word mm -hmm. for sort of concluding mm -hmm. thoughts uh, that you've taken away from our discussion today. Yeah. Well, we appreciate uh, the comments and the, and the general support, even though uh, we got some constructive criticism. And as we refine the final report, we'll take that all into account, including maybe taking a stab at the cost issue, which we didn't uh, uh, look at. But I wanted to just emphasize, I think, the, the most important thing at the end of the day, beyond specific capabilities, is that whatever we do has to reinforce the, the, unity, the unity of the alliance, the cohesion of the alliance. I, mean, I say that not just because I spent half my career working at NATO, but I think in this case, uh, if we want to actually get something done that provides a net increase in uh, deterrence, uh, and which will make that deterrence posture in the eyes of the Russians a much more permanent and lasting uh, uh, capability that they will take seriously, we have to do it in a way that all allies can, can support. And that means, uh, you know, that we have to come up with something that is balanced so that we don't have one ally or another saying, you know, this, this is all about defending one country. I didn't sign up for this kind of uh, shift in the emphasis in the fourth posture uh, when, when we agreed to the decisions at Warsaw or in the Brussels summit. Uh, we want to do it in a way that allies can rally around and even contribute to, which would be a sort of a bonus if it's, the U.S. can leverage some uh, contributions from allies. Otherwise, we're going to create this huge opening for, for Putin, not just with May, Merkel, and Macron, but with leaders across the alliance to drive a wedge to, to, to exploit fissures within the alliance. And uh, then the whole effort will have been uh, counterproductive. So I think we can do that. Uh, it's not a question of the NATO-Russia founding act. It's more a question of coming up with uh, the kinds of capabilities that will clearly be good, not just for, for Poland or for the Baltic states, but for the region and for NATO as a whole and will be seen as a sort of a, a building on the success that we've achieved in the three summits rather than t taking things in a different direction that will cause some allies to say, you know, whoa, where did that, where did that come from? 
but I think we can do that. We tried to sort of thread the needle in some of our recommendations, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, the administration is thinking along the same lines. Please uh, join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>